I hope you are fresh for the next talk. <laughs> I, 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 I know the next one is, is uh, very, very less technical, so maybe... <laughs> so I hope you are ready for some surprises for the next couple of hours. Uh, right now we have uh, uh, the, the next talk with Mariano Jaime. He's a, a computer vision engineer at, at Oculus. Uh, he's working with all these uh, computer vision things about how the the hardware captures your environment, the machine tracking, and all these things we love. So I hope we will enjoy the, this next talk. So thank you. So hello everybody. I'm Mariano. I am computer vision engineer or software engineer at Oculus Zurich, and I'm going to talk about. Facebook AR and VR, I'm going to talk about Oculus, I'm going to talk about headsets. Uh, I want to say two things before starting. So I normally pretty much prefer interactive talks. Well, I actually let you interrupt me and ask me any question. It's good for me because you give me a break and it's good for you because you also feel part of it. But since we are recorded, I think it's better if we probably postpone the questions by the end of the talk. The second thing I wanted to say before starting is like, I really had no idea about your background. So I, we have prepared like pretty high level slides. Now I realize that many of you are actually quite familiar with VR. So some of the content will be kind of redundant probably. But I hope and think that still there will be some things that you're not familiar with. So I hope that you will enjoy those parts. And people who are not very familiar with VR, hopefully will also follow most of the, of the slides. So. I'm pretty sure you all uh, know Oculus, but I don't know if you have heard about Facebook AR VR. So basically, Facebook AR VR is like um, a wider uh, organization that uh, works on any technology or experience that uh, can be applied uh, for AR or VR. Oculus is a big part of it, probably the, the source of it. Uh, and Oculus focuses on headsets in particular, and at the moment it focuses on VR. But there are other cases, like for example, applications or gadgets that you can see nowadays on Facebook apps or Instagram apps where you can put something like in augmented reality like a, an object on the floor or something. I will show some examples before. So Facebook AR VR is something that goes a bit beyond Oculus. For those who have never experienced VR that I think are very few in this room, like this is how VR feels. So basically you put on the headset, it's actually pretty hard to explain how it feels if you don't use the headset but you get immersed into a completely virtual world, right? And you can interact with objects. Uh, at the moment, we use controllers for interaction. Uh, in the future, we could also use hand tracking. So you might not need controllers to, to know where your hands are. And you can actually get the full pose of your hand just from images. At the moment, it's controllers in, in the products we have. And, and yeah, it's actually like we will have some demos afterwards. I, I was unsure about it, but I think we'll have some demos. So then if anybody hasn't tried it yet, I think we can try the Oculus Go afterwards. Uh, until this month, it's also no new information, I think, for most of you. Until this month, we had two products on the market. So we had the Oculus Rift and the Oculus Go. They both have different advantages and disadvantages. So uh, Oculus Rift was the very first product that we launched to the market. And it's about, uh, it focuses on gaming, basically, on games. It allows you to have six DOF. I don't know if you're familiar with the acronyms of six DOF and three DOF. So six DOF means six degrees of freedom for tracking. And that means that we actually estimate and know how you're moving in translations and how you're moving in rotation. So we know the full pose of your headset. And that provides you a like a full feeling of immersion in a game or an experience because we know where you are exactly in space. Uh, the Oculus Go on the other, on the other side uh, only has three of, and that means that we only know how you're rotating, we only know the direction uh, at which you're looking at, but we have no idea how you're moving, right? So if you, typically, if you move in an environment uh, in a different way that you're moving in reality, you might feel some motion sickness. Um, in the Go, that might happen more because we actually don't know like how you're moving, right? So it's more thought for media consumption or experiences, let's say, where you don't move that that much or do you? Well, uh, we have two new products coming to the market uh, this, uh, this month, actually. One is a, a new Rift, the Rift S, for which I don't have much uh, slides or content because it's actually uh, fresher. And, but we do have the Quest as well, for which I have more content. The Quest is basically uh, merging the advantages of both products. So 
Quest allows uh, to have six dot tracking, so we know exactly how you're moving in space, but you don't need to use like an external powerful, powerful computer anymore, and you don't need to use any cables. So you're free to use the Quest anywhere in any room. You don't need any special setup with additional cameras, so it's just put it on and basically play in, I, I haven't counted the minutes, but actually in very few minutes or seconds. Uh, how does it work? So basically, well, this is what I've just said. It creates, I will talk a little bit more, I think, in further um, videos, but it creates an internal representation of your environment. It has cameras uh, equipped, and then it tracks your position within that environment. So it basically creates a map of where you are and will track like special features to know where it is in space. As we are part of Facebook, we are also social. So we try to enable in VR uh, apps and experiences where we, people can connect and we can bring people together. This means that you should be able in virtual reality to uh, basically play with your friends, to meet your friends, to enjoy different experiences with your friends. There are different ways to do that. Uh, there, for example, uh, you might want to define an avatar for yourself and use that av avatar in a virtual environment. You might also want to define like a virtual environment itself where you meet your friends or you do some things. There are other um, experiences, uh, like for example this one in Oculus Venus, where you might meet your friends to see an event, um, and be there together, talk to them while you're consuming like an immersive video content. I don't really like the example that we show here because I am a Real Madrid supporter. I don't know if you saw that it's actually a, a goal from Barcelona, but I couldn't really choose this. Right? So. <laughs> Act, yeah, actually, like given the recent events, it's not like it's not the worst time to show this. But uh, yeah, and for example, this kind of content is um, has been recorded with a special hardware that has been developed. Um, in Facebook together with another company, I think it's called Red, and if I know wrong, the, the product is called Manifold. So I, I'm also gonna talk a little bit about this, um, this hardware later, but this hardware allows you to record high quality immersive video that can be consumed in, in VR headsets. And then, this is a question that I often get, uh, if we think about the, the future of VR and meetings, for example, if we want to have meetings in VR that are very realistic, where we can not only see like an avatar, like the ones I showed before, but we want to see very realistic avatar. People normally ask me, like, how is it gonna be possible to see realistic avatars if you have headset on? Like, how are we gonna know how your eyes look like, if you're smiling, if you're not smiling, that basically half of your face is partially covered, right? It's, it's pretty hard to recover that, even if you have cameras. Well, the answer is actually, you can recover. So there is research going on. So this is work, and I'm pretty sure this is not like super recent work, so this definitely has some months. We're using, I guess, a combination uh, of internal cameras and external cameras, um, like 3D models of people and faces. You can actually recover pretty realistically uh, how the face of the people look like, right? So this is not, as far as I know, in any product experience yet, but it's easy to imagine that it will eventually be, right? So the answer is yes. I think we will eventually reach a point when we can have very realistic meetings in VR. It's just we have some, like, still some way to go. Okay. So these are um, part or most of the topics we work on in Oculus. Uh, not all of them. I realize that, for example, graphics and rendering is an important one that's missing here. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the ones we work on in Zurich, in the office I come from. Uh, then after that, I'm going to talk about others that are also super important, but they're not particularly developed in Zurich. So in Zurich, we actually focus, about, uh, we focus on computer vision and artificial intelligence. So the Zurich office is a um, relatively new office. It's a fast-growing office as well. It's at a very, very nice location, at least for me, I love nature. It's actually my picture, so uh, I really enjoy the city and the landscape around. And it basically focuses on three key areas. So we have uh, positional tracking, which is uh, known externally as Oculus Insight. So you might have known the technology behind Quest and the Rift test that enables to know, as I said before, like the sixth of the full position of the headset in space without any additional 
camera or external camera. This is not only developed in Zurich, but it's uh, partly developed in Zurich. And we also work on mixed reality. Mixed reality, in case you have never heard of it, probably you have, but well, this is, there, is some, there are different definitions for mixed reality, augmented reality, and virtual reality, depending on the company. But like what we understand as virtual reality is you fully cover your eyes, and you generate like completely virtual content. Like it has nothing to do with the real content. Augmented reality is, for us, uh, something where you actually see the real world, but you put virtual places on top of the real world. So you still see the real world, but you see something virtual on top of it. And mixed reality is actually trying to bring the real world into a virtual headset. So basically, you will have virtual reality, but you try to add or use um, real content of your real world into that virtual environment where you actually are, or what you, what, what you, are, what you actually see. And then we also have uh, another team working on sensor calibration at different stages of products and sensors. So basically, we can work with experimental and devices, and, but it will also help or actually run the calibration of a headset in a factory. So as I said, yeah, now going back to how uh, Oculus Insight works. So basically, when you put the, the Quest on, I guess you've seen maybe this video if you saw the, the Oculus. Uh, um, <laughs> to have more features, I guess. So basically, the device starts to build a map. And for that, it uses what we normally call a visually distinct points. We actually call them corners. Corners are special points that you can easily recognize in the scene, right? Like this one could be a corner, for example, for the headset. Like I can move and I still can recognize this special corner, like special point in an image. And we incrementally build a map on the environment and we localize ourselves within that map. We also use like um, accelerometers, like inertial measurement units, to actually have like a very uh, high frame rate predictions of our poses. So images are not typically like 30 or 25 frames, but the accelerometer runs uh, at a very high frame rate or sensor rate. And the combination of these two sensors allows us to provide like very precise uh, pose estimates and also globally kind of consistent in time. We've, as, as part of our team, uh, we've also enabled like multiplayer uh, demos. I don't know if you've heard of this uh, Dead and Buried multiplayer demo that was shown in the last um, Oculus event in California, where um, basically these poses some sub challenges because if you want to have a multiplayer um, experience with Quest, you need to share that map where you're locating in. Basically, you, if you want to know where your friend or your enemy is, you, you need to have a consistent poses in that environment. Otherwise, like you're lost. You know where you are with respect to your environment, but you have no idea where your friend is with respect to their environment or their map they're actually building in their Oculus Quest. So we needed to adapt the normal workflow of Quest to enable these demos. Uh, it's actually a promising direction. Most people really, really like this when they, they play, and they normally come back and say, hey, we want you to enable these technologies. And, but, uh, we also, um, as a team, enable um, other applications that are not directly running, running headsets, like this augmented reality um, gadget that you can put in the world using probably I don't know, Instagram or Facebook. I'm not super familiar with this uh, effect. But yeah, one can also think about a um, case where you can share the experiences with your friends and family you could also build a map of your home and you could create like a virtual home on top of the real home and you can share with your kids, for example, your places like animals or teddy bears or whatever, and they go with their device and the tablet and they find the same things that you're putting in this world like consistently in time. Now, we're gonna talk a, lot, um, a little bit about uh, what mixed reality is. So basically mixed reality is about, um, is center about, or center on uh, interacting, recreating, and understanding the real world while you are in VR. And I'm gonna show a demo. I think it explains best what it means to use mixed reality. So this demo, we show somebody who is actually seeing the real world through something we call pass-through. It's also working in a virtual, like using several virtual displays. And at some point, it will get, it will get a notification say, hey, you, you have a meeting. So, he will go, or you can, while you're in VR, you can actually break physics. So he will go into a completely virtual room, escaping like the real room he was in, 
will probably meet somebody like a colleague or a friend and then can eventually go back to the real world. Right? This is a very early version of it, so as you can see, not, it's not super polished, but it will eventually also be polished and available like as, a, as an experience. So this is, um, am I going, might be going super fast. Yeah, I'm actually going super fast. So this is uh, things I wanted to, to talk about um, regarding most of the topics we work on in Zurich. And now I'm gonna discuss other topics that Oculus works on but has not been developed in Zurich. So there are basically three categories. So the first three points are, um, has something in common, which is how to create or generate 3D content for immersive videos, right? But they will use like different procedures and they will use different hardware. So I will explain in detail once we, we go in. And then I'm also gonna talk about um, hand tracking and eye tracking. So the first case is, uh, I think it's a typical case, probably most people familiar with VR has ever thought about it. Like you go somewhere on vacation and you find a place that you really, really like and you would like to share that feeling with your family or friends. But you only have a mobile phone, right? So you, it's not easy to generate like immersive videos with a mobile phone or maybe impossible depending on like your hardware. Um, but we would like to enable that. We would like to enable that you go somewhere to New York or to Iceland or whatever you like and you can generate content that your family or friends can consume in VR and feel as if they were there when you were there. Right? So we are working on that, for example, and this work uh, is based on how uh, to combine different images from mobile phones to generate 3D content for those images or that environment that the, the person was observing so that it can be observed in VR as if it was real. Like once we, like it's always a key part of this work to generate 3D content. So basically to get the 3D shape of the environment so that it's no longer just putting some texture on a panel, like a cylinder or a flat plane, but having actually the, the 3D knowledge of the, of the environment, which enables you to feel, or enables a user to feel as if they were there, because they can change a point of view where they are, and they will see that the wall moves consistently. So how does it work? Um, it actually uh, uses a phone that has a, what we call a stereo pair, so you need to have two cameras, and a stereo pair, uh, the advantage that it has is like, it sees the wall from a slightly different perspectives. And that is key because uh, when you see the wall from slightly dif different perspectives, you can actually estimate distance from the phone to the wall, like to every pixel that you observe. How, like the idea behind that is like when you have something that's very close to you, if you look at it with your mobile and you have two cameras, something that's very close is gonna appear very differently in the image. Like the shift in the, in the pixel is gonna be very high. While if I look at a pixel that is at the background, it's mostly gonna be at the, at the very same pixel, not my, probably not the very same pixel, but it's gonna be very close in both images, right? So using this, uh, we call this parity in images, uh, we can estimate with more or less precision like the depth or the distance of every pixel that we saw in those images. And then after that, of course, like one single image from one phone is not gonna cover like an entire environment. So what you need to do is like, you need to record like a video of this kind of stereo system and you need to combine it. You will need to estimate distances for every image, you will need to stitch those uh, both like the RGB images or photo monochrome images together with the 3D reconstruction that you've created for each image so that you eventually end up with a like comprehensive reconstruction of the environment. Right? Once you have that, like you can exploit that for many things. Like the obvious case is what I explained before. So you enable uh, observing this environment in VR, you can change the point of view while you are in it, but you can also uh, add content on top of it. So I'm not an expert in games, but you can actually start to play with this environment and use it for your game. Or you, you can probably modify it in 1,000 ways that I cannot even picture at the moment. You will be better at doing that than I would do. So this is the first application I wanted to talk about. Uh, the second case is uh, what if, if you actually have um, specific hardware, like custom hardware, to record high quality immersive video. So normally, let's say, this could be like an example of a movie sequence. This is what we record with a standard high resolution camera for a movie. You cannot change, as I said, the, the point of view, like the, um, 
the perspective. But with this sensor that Facebook developed together with uh, Red, you have several uh, high resolution and wide field of view images that enable, um, with post processing of those videos or, or images, to create like a 3D map of the environment as well. Like this could be depth. And then after that, you can do the same trick. So you can actually, once you know the geometry of the environment, you can move within that environment. You will never see like this, no, well, I'm not alone in question, so it's normal that nobody asks, but um, in the previous example, you can actually saw, in this case as well, like the moment you move too far from the original uh, point of view, you will see content that was not visible from an image. So basically, it's, we can, like, we are not magicians, right? Like, we, we cannot say what was there if no camera saw what was there. But you can do something, you can either interpolate and you can leave it black. But if your motion is not, if you don't go that far from the original point of view that you had with the camera, the effect should be quite realistic. And this could be the whole pipeline for this particular example. So the new hardware, the custom hardware, would record like this 316 um, high quality video. Then uh, we will need to estimate depth, like geometry, of, uh, from that video. Then we might need post-processing or not, I guess it depends on the case. And then it will be consumed by, by a headset or any other display. <coughs> so the third case is also different one, because in the third case, we are also targeting special hardware. And in this case, like we have I know, multiple wide field of view cameras, and we have an IR projector to estimate depth more easily. We have special um, device that they created to actually estimate positions of mirrors, so that they can add like one important aspect that's more a technical aspect of the paper that presented these results was about um, estimating mirrors and also adding mirrors to reconstructions, which is not so straightforward. And in this case, what we will do is uh, actually we will use this device, go to a room and record, like try to map the room. So we will move around with the device, we will record a video of it, and then offline we will try to reconstruct the, the, that environment. So we will try to get a high fidelity 3D map of that environment that we can use afterwards. So basically this is the um, the 3D map that they came up with um, after recording a sequence, and this was done in Oculus Research or Facebook Reality Labs now. And I think it's quite precise. Like I've seen many videos of this kind. And then you can also find the mirrors, right? After that, you can put texture, the like real texture that you also capture with the with the cameras on top of that, and then the result looks even better. So. One can think, like, why would you like to do that? Uh, there are two obvious cases coming to my mind. The first one is like furnishing. <laughs> this, I think, has been hovering in the air for, for long, as, as long as I can remember. So if you want to furnish or refurnish your apartment, you could build a 3D map of your home. You could more or less easily remove like the table or the sofa or the part of your home that you want to change. And you can place the new model of the new part, like provided to you by any com furnishing company. I guess there's one coming to the mind of all, all of us. And then you can easily and very realistically see how it fits your living room or your bedroom or your kitchen. Right? But it's not only that. Like we uh, have, for example, one limitation when we play VR. And the limitation is that we sometimes, well, very often, the map of the VR content doesn't match the map of your real environment, right? So you cannot go very far because you're going to hit the wall, you're going to hit the chair, you're going to hit the table. That's why we have the Guardian for that. If you do that, you could um, hypothetically adapt a video game to use the map of your real home, which is very handy because you can exploit the full space in your real home. And you can align real obstacles with virtual obstacles, right? So the, you, you can definitely exploit the space that you have available in a much better way than you could do with a standard game or procedure. Okay, so that was all for um, generating immersive content or 3D content for, to consume in VR. And then I'm gonna talk about hand tracking and eye tracking. So I guess probably everybody knows what hand tracking is. So hand tracking means that by processing images that observe our hands, we can know or we can say where the full hand is in a space, like every finger, every joint, all the time, like in real time. 
Why is hand tracking important? So there are ma three main reasons why it is important. The first reason is self-presence. So it's very weird if you go into VR, and probably many of you have experienced that. You go into VR, and you look down, and you don't see anything of you. Right? Your body is not there. Your legs are not there. Your hands might not be there, depending if you're grabbing the controllers or not. Once you start to see your hands, I think it starts to feel better. Like not seeing your hands is strange. Still not seeing your feet for some people is strange. For some people it doesn't really matter. Not seeing the torso is strange. But it's important to see your hands. It's important that you look forward and you know that your hands are forward because we always know where our hands are in space. And then if you don't see anything, like people really detect a mismatch between reality and the virtual world. The second reason um, are social hands. And I think even more here in the South, like in Spain or in Italy or other countries where we actually talk with our body. If we want to participate in events, in VR, meetings, we definitely want to bring that part of communication into VR as well. So it's important that you, not, you do not only hear what people are saying, but you also see how people are expressing themselves. And for me, it's normally, I always believe that body language is very, very important for communication. And the last application, which is probably the most obvious coming to your mind, is like as an input. So, at the moment, we use controllers to, to play with the headset, but we could eventually get rid of controllers and just use our hands. Like we could use gestures like this or this or this to um, perform different actions in virtual reality. And we actually have many more degrees of freedom than any controller has with our hands because we, like, our hands are very, very flexible. That also poses a problem. Like hand tracking is not a simple technical problem. Hand tracking is complicated. It is complicated because of the reason I said before, like there are many degrees of freedom. There are self occlusions and we also often interact with other objects that will occlude part of the hands. One hand will often occlude the other because we tend to use hands together or part of our bodies will occlude one or the other hand. So in this case, you can see results of hand tracking when they don't occlude themselves and the body don't occlude themselves. Hand tracking is actually already pretty reliable. But what happens? when they one occlude each other. So it's, it's hard to say it's kind of the same problem I said before um, regarding generating 3D content. So it's hard to guess sometimes what you don't see. And you, you can make hypotheses about how it could be or what's more likely to happen based on data. But at some point, like if one hand completely occlude and the other hand, like I cannot use my hands to put a sample, but it, it's hard to say if I'm bending one finger or not if you don't see my finger, right? Um, there are also cases we are uh, working on analyzing where we uh, decide to create a very, very uh, specific setup to have very accurate hand tracking. And why is that? Like, how can we benefit from that? So basically, in this setup, we use um, external cameras and reflectors to get like a very reliable hand tracking, as I said. And we, once we have this level of accuracy, we want to analyze if experiences like drawing or writing with very high precision are more or less useful in, for different purposes. Like we can test, a, I, mean, I don't participate in these experiments or this research, but it's easy to think that one can, like having that particular setup that can go ahead in time a little bit to see what we could enable in the future when we reach that level of precision in hand tracking. Right? Also similar things like with uh, interacting with objects, with physics, like ideally, we would like to have uh, something like this, where you're moving your hands in reality, and you're automatically um, playing with objects in the virtual world. And you don't need controllers at all. You just, we just know where your hands are. And the last topic I'm going to talk about, actually, yeah, my talk is going to be only half of the time, but is uh, eye tracking. So eye tracking um, can be and will probably be a fundamental component in VR. Why is that? So there are many, many issues that hand tracking can solve. And that's partially because recreating, like creating the physics or trying to recreate the physics of the real world in a headset is very complicated. One reason behind that is that we see in 3D and rays of light come to us in 3D. But when you have a headset, the headset is not doesn't have that 3D content in it. Headset has a panel with fixed lenses, at the moment at least. And that creates problems. That creates problems, for example, one of the famous ones is called the verge accommodation problem. When we try to focus 
But when we, well, we focus all the time unconsciously on objects, when we focus, we automatically change two things in our eyes. We change, I think, the retina, some muscles to adjust and see sharp only the point that we're looking at. But we also change um, the virgins of our eyes. So basically, when we look at something far ahead, our eyes are almost parallel in looking at the, at the background. When we look at something that's close by, our, age, our eyes converge. We do that automatically. Like we, our brain learned to do that when we were kids, and we don't think about it. In virtual reality, at the moment at least, in our headsets, um, we cannot, like, we break the system because we cannot modify the content in a way that these two systems of focusing close and virgins are consistent with the content we are providing to the users. And that creates problems uh, when it comes to focusing. I don't know if you've ever tried to focus on something or to put something super close to your eyes in VR. It very rarely sees or looks very sharp. I will show some, some videos afterwards, but if you try to add technologies to compensate for that. Uh, it's a technology that we call varifocal. So we actually move the plane that you're focusing at. You improve that massively, like the capacity to focus on different depth levels. There are other applications like forbidden rendering. Um, I don't know if you know what I mean by forbidden rendering, but basically we have something called the fovea in the eye that has a very high resolution uh, when it comes to nerves and perceptors. And it, it is only, it is actually very thin. So we only see with very high resolution something that is around five, well, stereo degrees or 10 stereo degrees around the ray that we are focusing on. Beyond that, like if you try to look at something and try to read or see the colors of something that is a bit to the right or to the left, we are pretty bad at recognizing that. That's very low resolution. That mostly, those perceptors are mostly used to detect changes. So to say that something is moving, but we constantly use the fovea to focus on the things that we are reading or we are looking at. That means that we can also exploit that information for rendering. So we don't need to render in high accuracy the whole scene. It would be enough to render with good resolution the part of the scene that we're looking at and render with low resolution everything else. That's impossible if we don't know where you're, we're looking at. Right? If, if we cannot say where people are looking at. So at the moment, we need to render in high resolution everything. But the moment we have eye tracking, uh, eye tracking we can enable that technology. Other problems that are well known are, for example, the depth of field. If anybody likes photography, might be familiar with that. So basically, when we look at something, we get some depth range that we get in focus, like we see it very sharp, but everything beyond a given depth and, well, beyond a given depth and closer than a given depth is going to be blurry for us. We cannot fake that in virtual reality either because of the same reason. We don't know where we're looking. So at the moment, everything is sharp. But when we have eye tracking, we can also have more realistic VR by sharpening only that depth range and blurring everything else as, our, like as, as it happens in the real world, basically. And the last application of eye tracking is also interaction. So one can, can think of using a menu by looking at something and blinking. And that could be the way to enter or to say OK to a given button. I've seen, like, I've tried that in the past. Probably not as flexible as hands, so I would prefer hands as inputs, but still, it's something to store. And how can we do eye tracking? Well, there are different ways, for example. We definitely need internal cameras to see your eyes, because we need, we need to know where we're looking at. We might or will probably need to know light, like artificial low light, to see, to project some pattern, or to actually just illuminate your eyes so that we can track your eye. There are different ways to place like the cameras within the um, within the headset, and I guess there will be compromises for the design. Headsets might get like bigger, heavier. That's that's why it's not it's not an easy topic to work on. So these are just pictures of some prototypes, and this video shows um, the example that I mentioned before about very focal. So typically, again, like seeing a video of how something looks in VR is kind of pointless sometimes, like you don't really know how it looks until you try it. But this could be how it looks when varifocal is off and you get an object like really close to you. When you enable varifocal, which is actually a technology that physically changes the display and moves it around a little bit, not much. Well, we couldn't move it like one meter, right? That wouldn't, wouldn't be a reasonable headset. But yeah. We can go uh, from something that looks like the one before to something that looks like this. I think it's a major, major. When you try it, it's a major improvement. But the technology behind that and how to ship that in a decent product and a product that's not super expensive is, is not so easy. To, so that's why it takes time. So it, it can make the difference between reading or not reading something. 
basically, which is very important. And that was all I have, so basically.